Welcome to another episode of the Distributed Data Show brought to you by Datastax Academy, where we bring you the latest news and interview technical experts to help you succeed in building large-scale distributed systems. Hello. Once again, Distributed Data Show. I'm live in the studio with Luke Tillman. Hello, everyone. And today, as a special treat, we have our Vanguard Solutions architect, Wei Deng, and we are going to ask him a ton of questions about securing distributed databases. Um, super hot topic, and we're going to have a lot of fun with this. So why don't you take a minute and introduce yourself, Wei. Hello, hello. So uh, my name is Wei Deng, and uh, information security has been my main area of interest for close to 20 years. Uh, during my whole career, I've been working at various IT roles from research to development to operation to management to training. All of them are somehow related to security. So I've been here at DataStax for four years, and a lot of what I do here is to help our enterprise customers to understand how to leverage many of the DataStax enterprise security features so that they can implement their security data platform that is able to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data. So another part of my job is to put together training content of um, data stack advanced security for both our field engineers and our customers so that they understand the concepts and they see some hands-on examples and they learn best practices to speed up their deployment. And uh, since this month is my four years anniversary with data stacks. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thank you, thank LinkedIn you. LinkedIn told me I, that last week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I also want to add another interesting fact. So when I when I joined the DataStax in 2013, it was just a few months after DataStax released the DSC 3.0 with a whole slew of security features. So that include uh, authentication and authorization framework, password and uh, Kerberos authentication, SSL, transparent data encryption, and then auditing. So that's a lot. And remember, this was also the first time we ever introduced security features into the DSE product ahead of uh, many other NoSQL databases in the market. So being able to offer such a comprehensive set was pretty impressive. That was no small feat. I still remember some blog posts at that time were titled like, NoSQL means no security or other <laughs> mean words. Yeah. Oh yeah, we've seen those articles, absolutely. You still see those articles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice so that, that was. Yeah, that Go was ahead. a general perception. That was a general perception of the NoSQL world. Like, you know, uh, NoSQL is fast and loose, right? So you don't have security. And and DataStax was actually the one that who, who was leading the charge to, in changing that perception. So it was amazing for me to, like, you know, from my personal perspective, it was amazing for me to watch over the last four years. We've got a lot of adoption of those features from our enterprise customers. And we continue to add more capabilities such as the LDAP authentication, the KMIP support for external key management, role-based access control and role-level access control so that we can help our customers to meet their ever-changing, ever more stringent requirement of a data protection. So I've, I've, uh, in, in, in one word, I, I, I've stayed long enough to be that eyewitness to see the full progression of our security features ever since its inception. Very cool. So, like, I love that we had you on, that we're having you on right now, just because, um, you know, we kind of said, you know, you see the news articles all the time, and you've seen a ton of them, like, you know, the Equ Equifax breach recently, um, oh, yeah. you know, like, security is constantly in the news, somebody's getting hacked, and um, there was mm -hmm. just a, there was just a Bluetooth vulnerability, a big Bluetooth vulnerability that just came out recently. Um, so, it's awesome to have you on to talk security, like, kind of, I, I guess it's probably always a, t a timely sort of topic, but, so maybe um, you can start by kind of talking about um, what kind of security risks we're trying to address when we talk about securing uh, securing distributed database. Oh wow, you're asking a really really big question <laughs> in three sentences. <laughs> or less. No, yeah. no, we're kidding. To fully cover it, it's probably going to be a book, right? So at least a book chapter. So yeah. so what I'm going to do is to to name a few examples that comes to my mind, and this won't be comprehensive, but I will try. Okay, so <laughs> it better be comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> basically, when I when I look at the risks, I tend to look at different actors. So uh, no matter if they are malicious or not, I, I look at those different actors, and then I'm looking at the potential threats they can incur to a data system. So for the actors, what I mean is uh, they're normally in three categories. So there's unauthorized users. 
there are uh, authorized user, but without the proper access privilege. And then there's an authorized user with access privilege, but they they may be deliberately or unknowingly disclosing data. So so uh, then I listed uh, uh, the, the potential threats they can bring and what we can do to prevent them, respectively. So uh, so there are uh, the, 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 the threats I can think of right now. Uh, so the first one is tampering the data. So this could be tampering the data by modifying the data packet on the wire or data file on the disk. For example, I have an original record uh, that to describe I have a hundred dollar money transfer from account A to account B. So if a malicious authorized user can intercept the packet on the wire, and then they can modify the amount from one hundred to one thousand, then he can have some financial gain, right? Do you know how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this after the year, I may show you. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we're with you so far. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, if directly modifying or replacing the network packet is difficult, then another way is to sniff the original packet. Then you can also do a replay for ten times. You can still get that ten a thousand dollar you want, right? So you know, it's, it, this is called uh, usually called replay attack, right? Yep. And then similarly, if the user is authorized to SSH into the database server but does not have the privilege to access the record from the database directly, they can still go directly to the directory, the file system, where the data file is stored and modify the raw record. So to prevent this from happening, uh, we will have to leverage some of the features, like from DSC, we have the in-flight encryption. So if everything, every packet that's transferred out of the while is already encrypted, then there's nothing you can do about that uh, mod modification uh, attack or the uh, replay attack. Uh, or you can ask uh, for, for, the, for the data on the disk, you can actually apply the at rest encryption from DSC. Um, as, and, and also DSC have some feature that's called uh, checksum for the SS table for, for data file. Um, so this way, if you combine all these at rest encryption, in flight encryption, uh, and checksum and digital signature, then you will be able to maintain the integrity of your data. So that's that's the first kind of uh, uh, threat, you know, uh, for people to temper your data to impact the integrity of your data. There's some some kind of uh, uh, mechanism we'll be able to prevent that. And the second one is, uh, you know, how about stealing data, right? So uh, either uh, the stealing data from your network or from the disk. Again, in this case, any authorized user who can sniff the network packet or have access to the data file on the disk, they will be able to steal the data. In this case, uh, similarly, DSE in-flight and at-rest encryption will be able to uh, can be used to protect the confidentiality of the data. And the third one is uh, faking identity. So mm -hmm. in this case, you will need to to, to have a effective authentication mechanism to make sure that a user to the database is indeed the user uh, this this person claims to be. So you will also need to have some way to prevent session hijacking by a malicious user. Like because uh, once your 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 session is established from from the client to the server, if that session got hijacked, then whatever that you have already passed the authentication will be uh, you, the, the malicious user will be able to reuse that. That's not good, right? Yep. So DSC uh, in this case DSC provide multiple authentication method uh, such as password, or Kerberos, or LDAP to address this kind of threat. And another one I, I want to bring up is, uh, uh, you know, there's always, uh, it's just human nature, right? So we all we all are required to use password, but we all tend to use weak password. Right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Monkey, I believe, is the most popular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> For for authorized user with privilege to access the data, you still want to prevent them from using an easy to guess password. Or, or use the same password against many systems, or don't change password for too long, right? Yeah. So in this case, if you can leverage DSC's Kerberos or, or LDAP authentication method, then you can actually manage the password complexity and then enforce the password policy on a centralized external authentication server, such as uh, like you know Microsoft has uh, Active Directory server, which is very popular among our customers, so that um, you will be able to address this kind of a threat.
Okay, then another thread is uh, unauthorized accessing tables and rows. What I mean by that is uh, your database may have some sensitive data stored in some tables or some rows within the table, and you, you really shouldn't open them up to all the users authenticated to the database. So in this case, authorization mechanism based on the user or the user's role becomes important. And to prevent uh, authorized access provided to the uh, authenticated user, uh, we can also leverage DSCE's authorization control so that you can you can actually uh, just issue some command uh, like a grant a permission or revoke a permission. Those commands are very similar to what you will see in the relational database. And at the same time, you can also make this membership of, of those roles to be managed internally in the DSC table, or you can track that externally in some directory service. So is this the kind of thing that's going to prevent a dumb developer like me from dropping a table that I'm not supposed to drop, you know, because somehow they let me on the production system and, <laughs> you know, I oh, totally, accidentally. Totally. <laughs> they, they should never give you the admin access to begin with, right? So you're, you're a developer. You should not have admin access. That's probably true. That's probably yeah, probably true. true. But does this also mean that, uh, there are some rows that I, as a developer, can see within a table, and then there's some rows that I can't. Is that what you're talking oh, about? Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, that's that's what I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a feature that's called row level access control, so that I can actually base on a content of one of the columns, uh, so that you can match up to your your user login and. Uh, uh, some 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 of the rows can only be visible by one user, but another user. Uh, so even though they're in the same table, you have that level of separation. Oh, I've wanted this for so long because <laughs> if you've ever thought about how would I implement a multi-tenant app? Um, oh, totally. Using Cassandra, this is this is gold. Yeah, so, it used to come up all the time in my previous job. Like, yeah, who's going to have row level access and how, or who has row level access and yep. Yeah, cool. this was this was introduced in DSC five one to exactly to address the multi tenant situation. So yeah, we we do hear from our developer community, our our customers, and uh, we got that implemented in five point one. Yep, very cool. Yeah, and, and lastly about the threads, um, but not finally, this is really just uh, all I can think about. Uh, is this um, uh, lack of accountability. What do I mean by lack of accountability is that for author authorized user with privilege to access the data or for the database administrator who can perform any action like add or remove user or create a drop table, you will need them to be held accountable for the ac actions. So you, to achieve this goal, DSC provide auditing capability that you can configure for different activities. And then you can also specify what key, key spaces you can include to, to log such activity. Uh, and uh, beyond that, the, the log entries can also be sent to a central log server. So once it's on the central log, log server, there's no repudiation. You cannot really de deny you have ever done something. <laughs> so everyone's going to know when I drop that table <laughs> that I had access to <laughs> that I shouldn't have. Who's this yeah, exactly. Will Tillman? Yeah, exactly. Right. So wait, I'm interested, um, like some of the stuff that you've been talking about are familiar to me, like with the relational database background, like I've heard, you know, some of these mm -hmm. similar sort of concepts. So I'm curious, um, you know, what makes securing a distributed database difficult and maybe how does like securing distributed database compare to maybe what some people who are listening or watching uh, have done previously, you know, in, in, in relational databases? That's a great question. So in my view, in general, distrib distributed databases really have to address the same kind of a security challenge like a normal single node or relational mission critical database needs to address. Right. But on top of that, it also needs to cover some unique challenges in the distributed environment. So that makes the securing distributed database uh, extremely hard, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to go into some details on each of the points here. So first, uh, talking about the same security challenge, comparing the distributed database and uh, relational database, you still need to worry about those typical database security vulnerabilities like insufficient or ineffective input validation, okay. or uh, weak authentication, or insecure communication, or illegal access to unencrypted data. When you say when you so, say insecure communication, do you mean like between clients, like between code that I'm writing as a developer and the database? 
Is that what you're kind of talking yeah. about? That kind of communication? Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you need that to be encrypted, right? So, sure. so if that's not protected, then uh, you 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 will leak some some very sensitive information. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point too, because I, securing your distributed database that extends all the way out to the driver, all the way out to your application, right? Where it first enters that yeah. database world. That's part of what we're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, uh, beyond that, uh, the, the, the similarities between the distributed database and uh, relational database, uh, this NoSQL distributed database is well known to be designed with architectural flexibility to offer some, some good performance mm -hmm. and scalability, right? But the same architectural flexibility also presents some great security risks. For example, if you think about a distributed database in general, Usually, you have to build in some horizontal scaling capability. For example, uh, clustering, sharding, replication. Right. I'm not saying that the sharding is used by DSE, but you know, they, you you know who I'm talking about. What, what kind of database? <laughs> they think, right. Oh yeah. Um, but it it opens yeah with, with this kind of a horizontal scaling capability, it opens up a, a new attack surface where the data store is vulnerable to node impersonation attack. Do you, do you know what I mean by node impersonation? No, I don't think. Explain it. Yeah. So so basically, uh, when you think about, if you're familiar with the Cassandra, how Cassandra like looks like a ring, you can basically just um, uh, if there's no uh, protection on that, you can just drop in another node and just give it the same cluster name and just tell it to 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 bootstrap, and uh, then it will just immediately become a member of that cluster and start accepting rights. Right. Right. And so it then has a at least a portion of the data that's accessible to it, that's being streamed to it or being written to it. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's so, crazy. Uh, having, yeah. having said all this, the good news is that DSC does have security features to address all those challenges I just mentioned, right? So for input validation or the uh, what they call sometimes called the NoSQL injection risk. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> in addition to encouraging the, the, the good habit in the application code and always filtering invalid input, which is, you know, as an application developer, you really should do all, all the time. The DSE driver usually recommends using prepare statement as a best practice. So then, when you when you actually use the prepare statement, the attack surface for the uh, the NoSQL injection or CQL injection will be a lot less. Yeah, this looks exactly like if you're if you have an SQL background, you'll be familiar with bind variables and yep, it's the same same yes. sort of thing that you'd be used to. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, for authentication. DSC provides support for password of Kerberos LDAP and also allows unified authenticator to combine any two of them to work together. So in this way, this is a lot stronger than just a simple password MB5 based authentication. And for the client to server communication, all of the DSC's SQL drivers have support for SSL or TLS. So none of the sensitive information between the client and server will need to transfer in client text to prevent Illegal access to unencrypted data. DSE also provides transparent data encryption combined with the external key management, where KMIP. So for the node uh, imp impersonation concern, DSE also support SSL and TLS between the DSE servers within the same data center across remote data centers. So now, if you are actually in that CA, in that PKI infrastructure then you don't have to worry about node impersonation because uh, any node that's not signed by the CA will not be accepted by all the other peers. No, that's interesting with that. When you're using that key infrastructure across a cluster, do all the nodes then have to exchange private or uh, have to do key exchange between all those nodes? No, no they, they don't have to do key exchange. What they do is that they, they basically, all of them will have to have their own identity. So basically mm -hmm. generate a pair of keys the private key and public key, and the public key will be signed by a CA. Maybe it's an enterprise CA. So that CA will basically say, uh, your public key is associated with your, your host name. So I trust you. I, I, I can prove to other people that I trust you. And then if everybody else can trust the CA, then they will be able to do that the initial key exchange uh, using this uh, uh, public key certificate. Right, so that there is a little bit of extra work that's involved when you're using this PKI. Because yeah. if to add a new node, for example, that actually 
that public key needs to go to all the other nodes, doesn't it? Or help me out. Yeah. Uh, the public key does not have to go to all the other nodes. Mm -hmm. It's actually, uh, it's it's way easier than that. Um, the, the idea about this is that uh, when you when you actually start to doing that communication with the, all the other DSE nodes, uh, the first thing you are doing is that what, what we call the SSL handshake. So during that SSL handshake, you will actually send your public key certificate to the remote end. Okay, so so let me explain how this uh, certificate works. Uh, you do not have to pre-distribute uh, all your certificate to all the other nodes. So what you really need to do is that during that initial SSL handshaking, you are basically you are sending this certificate, your public uh, key certificate that's signed by CA. You're sending that over to your remote party. A remote party basically will just look at the signature of that certificate and see this is signed by a CA and this CA I trust. So then I actually trust the connection of this public key to this identity of the, of the remote node. Got it. Thanks. These are the challenges from the just from the architectural and application design side. But there are also some security challenges during the deployment. For example, some of the distributed databases, you know uh, who they are. I, I, I won't name names. That's fine. Uh, they are designed to work out of the box. They, they, they really try to design to be really, really easy for developers. So then a uh, post installation, there's really no little or no configuration required. And uh, one of them is that you know they, they just don't cover authentications and never uh, make that authentication to be enabled. This is actually great for testing out a new product in a lab environment, but uh, obviously you will need to address the authentication prior to deployment in the production environment. However, people often forgot about that and put an unprotected database online. So this is why you see news about uh, like large number of NoSQL databases getting owned by hackers and held for ransom. Yep. So this is one of the things I really like about OpCenter. That is um, uh, another management tool I haven't talked about yet, but uh, OpCenter really has a fancy provisioning tool called Lifecycle Manager that can help you to, to implement this kind of uh, security by, by default kind of concept on your cluster. Uh, so what what do I mean by that is that even if you don't want to spend the time to learn how to enable authentication for your DSC cluster, as long as you hand your cluster over to OpCenter to manage, it will automatically enable the authentication for you. And uh, what's more beyond that is at a click of a checkbox, you can even automatically enable the SSL and TLS for client to server and server to server in flight encryption. So this this means that uh, we just talk about like you know this uh, uh, key generation a pair of uh, public key private key and then get it, getting that key signed by CA and then generating that key um, importing that back into the key store it's a very tedious kind of process all of that tedious work will be hidden by uh, by OpCenter's uh, lifecycle manager provisioning so you don't have to worry about that but you can actually get to benefit from this uh, uh, additional protection on the in-flight encryption. So I'm curious. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you something that's like sort of an opinion thing, and you can uh -oh. you can refuse to answer if you know. If it's okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, do you think that, um, uh, say, open source Cassandra or DSC, do you think it should ship with security turned on by default? Like, do you think that there should be sort of you know the? I guess we're weighing the secure versus like ease of, you know, ease of use for a developer you know that's just trying it out or something for the first time like do you wish that that um, that kind of stuff shipped with with security turned on or would it even be worth it because it'd just be some default password that you know hackers would have just as easy of a time hacking into and ransoming anyway you may have answered your own question <laughs> i don't know you know you know the 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 random password that 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 kind of aspect you know the the default password that everybody knows that's always going to be published online yeah that right. aspect uh is actually perfectly addressed by this uh, uh life cycle manager option to life cycle manager provisioning because what happens there is that life cycle manager once they start to to take over the control of your cluster the first thing it asks about is for you to set a new password. So it never use a random password. It never use like a defined password that everybody knows that's going to be published online. It's always going to be a password that you sign, assign it to. Gotcha. So it's never going to be the same uh, uh, across two, two, two different clusters, option to LCMs managing. 
And maybe that's really the way is to have something that coaches you through the best practices. Yep. Right. Yeah. I really love that because, you know, that, that's, that's exactly to, to answer your question is that uh, I, I wish that everybody, like even if you're a developer, if you can actually make your dev cluster to be managed by op center, it will make things a lot safer. So you don't have to worry about like, you know, just making that available on public cloud. Yeah, I've known lots of dev clusters where they, <clears throat> where it's a clone of the production cluster, maybe with some data scrubbing done, and you know, it's like, yeah, you can you can end up exposing stuff that you didn't mean to in a dev environment, you know, mm -hmm. without right. even thinking about it. Yeah, and that actually that leads me to another question that I wanted to ask you, Wei, is that, uh, you know, our database security is only one aspect of our overall enterprise security solution. Um, so it's usually the case that we're gonna be deploying uh, you know, our distributed database into an existing enterprise, which has its own security infrastructure that's already in place. So you know, can we talk about that, about how, uh, how a distributed database kind of needs to integrate with existing security infrastructure and what that looks like? Yeah, so I always, um, uh, you know, just just like to talk about this 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 one rule, one principle I've learned in in all these years working in security. Uh, it is the principle of a defense in depth, right? Mm. So there's really no one layer of security that will be your your silver bullet. So when you think about building a secure environment, you really have to consider, uh, you know, there are at least. Uh, like three main aspects. One is called uh, administrative security, such as like uh, good security procedures or uh, run books, uh, you know, for, for, for following those um, uh, procedures or guidelines. Uh, and then there's also physical security. Uh, for example, like, you know, your, your data center, uh, your physical access control, uh, like your CCTV. And then you need to have, uh, think about this, uh, all this uh, technical security. Uh, such as uh, uh, hardware security, OS security, storage security, network security, in addition to database security. So really, when you think about it, database security is really just, uh, it's, it's really important because it holds the crown jewel of your organization, which is your data. Uh, but still, right. Right. it's only part of your overall security design. So Wei, what, um, what security features should I be looking for in a distributed database then? So I, I kind of uh, uh, covered that a little bit, uh, but uh, I guess maybe I, I can just uh, put that here, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to talk about those uh, security features again. Um, so basically what I would consider as uh, essential would be authentication, authorization, and auditing. So this is some, uh, you know, in the security world, people usually talk, uh, just, just talk about this as uh, uh, triple A, right? So this is the, one of the most important aspects um, but then there's also encryption. Um, so that, that include both the address encryption and in-flight encryption. Um, and, and of course, if you want to be really secure for that address encryption, you really don't want to store your encryption key along with your data. Uh, that, that will be similar to like you, 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 you use your key to lock your house and then leave your key under the doormat. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's a great analogy. Yes, yeah, so sort of self-defeating. Yeah. So, so, go ahead. So, so the uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, I would consider compatibility with uh, external key management will be a really important feature as well. Got it. So, uh, sticking with the theme of features for a second, is there some feature? in DSC that sort of gets overlooked or that you wish people like more people knew about that uh, that doesn't maybe get as much uh, as much publicity oh yeah uh, this one I I really love uh, but uh, I guess uh, we don't really have uh, a lot of documentation about um, and uh, you know people just don't realize how powerful it is uh, which is this um, uh, in the DSC 5.0, ever since DSC 5.0, because we are able to allow you to use LDAP as external role management, um, you can actually combine this uh, LDAP external role management with uh, Kerberos authentication. So what do I mean by that is, uh, think about this. Uh, on a typical enterprise, like many of our customers, they use Active Directory for uh, right. for their uh, both the Kerberos server and LDAP server, right? So everything is consolidated. All the account management 
even the group management is consolidated. So now if you can say, I want to just um, use Kerberos authentication, uh, which is the, uh, you know, really compared to LDAP authentication is actually the most safer way, is the preferred way when you think about the deploying an enterprise. Um, so if I use the Kerberos authentication, but at the same time, if I can actually make all these Kerberos principles to be uh, grouped together under some roles, and uh, I do not have to worry about assigning individual Kerberos principles with some privileges within my database. All I need to do is say, I want to assign a particular role or particular group, some privileges within the database. And then the rest of that management is handed over to the Active Directory admin. That will be a lot, lot more natural for the Active Directory admin to manage all this um, uh, uh, like membership like uh, adding new users, deleting users, moving one user from one group to another, all of that is much easier for uh, for the overall management. So this is actually one of my favorite feature uh, that I, I uh, you know, I, I myself figured this out like just this year when after 5.0 came out for like six months, I realized this is actually very powerful. Um, I hope that I can help to to actually contribute to some documentation to make this um, feature to be more visible. Right. So that that's actually reducing uh, another place that you have to configure security. Is that right? That exactly. instead of having to go and uh, yeah, I have my Kerberos, my groups, and my users there, and I have to set it up there, and then I have to go and duplicate that a lot of that same work in my database. Now you're saying it can just all, all that can that all of that user and role and group configuration can just, just kind of live in one place. Right. That's fantastic. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's centrally managed. Yeah. I've worked, I, it's funny. I've actually worked in a lot of it shops where that was sort of the preferred way of doing things was to, you know, you even managed your, <clears throat> your users that were going to be used to do database access inside of active directory. So I'm with you. I've seen that, seen that in action, but I actually want to go back to something that you kind of briefly mentioned in that answer. And just to see if you'll, uh, if you, maybe you can kind of explain a little bit why you said this, you said you, you, that in a lot of enterprises, Kerberos is actually the best or the strongest or the preferred way of doing authentication as opposed to LDAP? Yeah, you kind of said as opposed to mm -hmm. LDAP authentication. Why is that? Why is Kerberos, like what makes it better or more preferred or? or... Mm -hmm. so, so Kerberos basically has this um, uh, really nice design, uh, even though it's, it's introduced in the 80s and 1980s, uh, it's, it's a long time now. Uh, it, it does have a very nice design that uh, one of the things that Kerberos has there is that uh, the user credential, the username and user password is never sending clear text over the while. Okay. So, so basically anybody can sniff the packet, they won't get anything useful out of it. Huh. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Well, this has been just super educational for us and we i've learned a lot about uh, security features that i didn't realize were even there in in dse and uh, we appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us about security in general so what if we want to learn more my my appetite uh has been elevated here for for more security learning so where can i go what resources do we have available so um I, I would say that this uh, data stacks actually has a, a dedicated website that's called uh, Security Assurance. So if you actually search for data stacks security assurance in Google, you will be able to find the, the, the site. So that one does provide quite a bit of a resources, uh, including uh, you know best, some of the best practices and, and then uh, even some of those uh, our security stands, like how we're dealing with uh, third party vendors. Uh, you know that, that that kind of thing, and even there is also some CVE, some some vulnerability uh, oh, kind of yeah. announcement. Uh, we have all there, uh, so that's definitely some some resources that you don't want to miss. Uh, but uh, on top of that, there's also um, like our whole security section of our documentation website has has uh, received a lot of uh, uh, new improvements, and I, um, I I would highly recommend you to go there. Um, especially if you if you don't have any time to go over the whole document about security, uh, at least uh, drill down into those uh, uh, this checklist, security checklist, 
uh, they actually categorize this checklist in, in uh, for different kind of uh, workload, uh, for search, for uh, real-time Cassandra, for analytics, for graph. They all have some some checklist items for you to follow. So that will be some very useful um, resources uh, if, yeah. you, if you want to learn more. I mean, that checklist especially, I, I feel like that, you know, ha one less thing to try to have to figure out. And we all know, uh, or, and we've heard of people who get creative with security and sort of invent their own things and, and improvise. And that's almost never a good thing. And I feel like sometimes you do just want to make it as simple and straightforward as possible. I'm going to walk this checklist. I'm going to make sure that these things are configured correctly, you know, according to what some other person has thought through. And, and that really yeah. tends to reduce risk in a big way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and it won't forget anything, right? So exactly. at least the important ones. Well, way um, security is always a topic. Um, so I have a feeling we'll probably be seeing you again uh, at some point in the near future. Thanks a ton for uh, for coming on. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to everyone that is listening or watching out there. We will see you again on another episode of the Distributed Data Show. See you next time. See ya. Thank you for joining us again for the Distributed Data Show. We love your feedback, so go to the Distributed Data Show page on Datastax Academy and tell us what you think. You can also find us on the Datastax Academy YouTube channel or find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get great podcasts. While you're there, make sure and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode.